station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio. Hi, welcome to Question Reality. I'm your host, Priscilla Leona, and we're coming to you live from Studio City, California. Our show is broadcast every Sunday from 5 p.m. to 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If this is your first time tuning in, our show will help you question your career reality. This show is for you if you were, are, or might be considering a career in the entertainment industry. Our guests will provide provide advice and resource information on how and what it takes to successfully pursue a career in show business. Our guests work in various professions of entertainment, so that means we will definitely have someone on the show sooner or later from a career that you are interested. If you want to check out any of our past guests, read their bios, listen to their interview instantly, or download one of the shows, go to the LA Talk Radio website, which you should be on now if you're listening to us live, but in case you're not uh, and listening to us on the iPhone, go to latalkradio.com and click on the link at the top of the website that says Channel One. You scroll down, look for the graphic of our show, Question Reality, and you click the link. This will take you directly to our archive page where you can view the list of past guests. We have Emmy Award winners, Broadway Tony winners, we have Clio winners, we have Silver Microphone winners. We, no matter what type of winner you are, you're going to be on my show on that list. So check it out. We've got a lot of great advice for you. Our shows are also available for download on iTunes under the podcast section. You just type in Question Reality Radio in the search box, and all of our shows will come up. We're also, again, on I, the iPhone. You can download the application and listen to our shows live, any shows on LA Talk Radio for that matter. And we're also going to be available on the Droid system pretty soon, and I'll keep you updated about that. If you want to find out about future guests that are going to be on the show, you want to visit our official Question Reality website directly, and that address is Question Reality dot us not dot com question reality dot us and it has all of the fantastic guests for the rest of 2010 and you know our show has become so popular i'm already booked until the end of february 2011 it's so exciting i really really appreciate all the people that email and call in and tell me how much they love the show and how much it has helped them i've had uh, stockbrokers change their careers and are now pursuing, well, as a stockbroker, you probably do need to change your career, but I've had them pursue a career in acting um, and try out for Broadway. I've had guys who've been working uh, in the banking business for a long time who've changed their careers and they listen to our show. So I'm very, very excited. I even have the guy who, uh, he's coming on the show. He is the um, owner of CDBaby.com, Derek Sivers, and he's a fan of the show, and he's going to be coming on in 2011. So we've got a lot of exciting, exciting people coming on. Um, So today, the excitement is very, very much alive today in us at the studio because we have a great, fantastic, wonderful, sexy, energetic, vibrant, alive, oozing with uh, love for the theater, great actress. Her name is Alexandra Billings. She is an actress and a singer, cabaret singer. She is, I'm going to let you tell, I'm going to let her tell you how wonderful she is because I could just go on forever. But first, we're going to do some advertisements. You know, we got to pay the bills, honey. Let's do some advertisements. Okay, until August the 29th, and I really feel proud announcing this because Guys and Dolls is one of my favorite musicals, and it is playing until August 29th at the West Valley Playhouse. And uh, in case you aren't familiar with the story, which I'm sure most of you are, but just in case, Guys and Dolls is a 1950 musical that's drawn from two short stories uh, by Damon Runyon. And 
<laughs> what you'll do is you'll meet these lovable thugs and their long-suffering dolls. They were also called malls. Uh, some of the best music, as you know, came out of this production. A couple of the songs were Luck Be a Lady, uh, let's see, Guys and Dolls, uh, and Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, etc., etc. So, again, this play, it's directed by John Barry, and the musical director is Patricia Hannafan. And you don't want to miss this theatrical experience because I have heard wonderful things about this. I myself are I'm going uh, later on in the month, uh, only until August 29th. And again, it'll run uh, August 29th, Friday and Saturdays at 8 p.m. and Sunday at 2:30. The West Valley Playhouses locate 7242. Owens Mouth Avenue. That's O W E N S M O U T H Avenue in Canoga Park. And you can call right now for your tickets. The phone number is 818 884 1907. And I forgot to tell you to get your pen and paper, but get your pen and paper because I got some exciting stuff coming up. Uh, again, 818 884 1907. Or you can visit their website wvplayhouse.com wvplayhouse.com and our next and final announcement is Wayne Schoenfeld oh I love this man not only is he tall and distinguished and handsome and sexy in his quiet brooding ways but he is an incredible fantastic digital photographer and a uh, a documentarian and he has won awards from every place on the earth he's also a LACMA member at Los Angeles County Museum of Art and part of the Photographic Arts Council, and I was, I'm giving him this plug because I was in a couple, I'm a plus-size model, and I uh, was in one of his wonderful series, which was called Icons and Iconoclasts, and um, some of the work from that series is going to be on display at the Creative Photographic Workshop and Gallery. It's during the Miracle Mile Art District um, project that they have every year and during this collaborative event two of Wayne Schoenfeld's art will works will be on display again one from the icons and iconoclast series and the second from a humanitarian photo report shot that he did in ethiopia which uh w- went over so well and he's won multiple awards for that this uh exhibition again it's featured in the opening of the miracle mile art walk so you don't want to miss it it's in front of lacma los angeles county museum of art between six and nine you can also check out wayne schoenfeld his work at wayne Schoenfeld.com, W-A-Y-N-E-S-C-H-O-E-N-F-E-L-D.com, or check it out directly on the website, creativephotoworkshops.com. So, <clears throat> very exciting stuff for you. Now, back to the overexcitement that we're going to get from this guest. Again, let me just tell you a little bit uh, how I came to have her on the show. Uh Our guest is on the show today because in December of last year, I went to see a Christmas play that two of my friends were in. It was this really cute little theater. Excuse me. I can't remember the entire name of the play. It was so long. But I do remember that it had a Dr. Frankincense in there. And the play was so cute. And they were just so, uh, they meshed so well. The ensemble was fantastic. I mean, I I would call this just a total ensemble cast. I mean, it was so well balanced with everybody having a great part, singing and dancing. And they got the audience involved. And this guy uh, had written this wonderful piece for the 12 days of Christmas, I still remember that. It was just, uh, I thought, wow, I would really like to have that at one of my parties. I wish I could get a copy, which I never did. But it, he, was a, he was a great writer if he, if he did, in fact, write that himself. So <clears throat> one person, even though they were all fantastic, there was one person that I was blown away with. I mean, when this woman, Alexandra Billings, who is our guest today, when she comes out, you, your eye just goes right to her. There is such a verb. I mean, she just creates, she's magnetic to watch. And my husband and I, uh, we had friends with us. All of us agreed that we could not take our eyes off her. She just was, she just, I don't know, embodied like the true theater. I felt like I was sitting in a theater on Broadway, even though I was in a little theater 
theater, you know, in LA, I felt like I was watching a full Broadway show. Um, so her name is Alexandra Billings, and she is a stage, film, and cabaret performer. Uh, her novice years, just to tell you a little bit about her from what I understand, her novice years included works on shows with Cal Burnett, Once Upon a Mattress, Yul Brynner, The King and I, Sandy Duncan, Peter Pan, and appearances in everything from The Fantastics to The Roar of Grease Paint, Smell of the Crowd. Uh, also working backstage, as she did in the theater, gave Alexandra the notion of what theater really was. And she's quoted as saying, uh, hard work, dedication, and lots of eyeliner which yes that is true uh she has won multiple awards for her work <clears throat> such as uh after dark awards for best actress in a comedy in charles bush's vampire lesbians of sodom uh or sodom hmm. uh after work uh, award for best actress playing margot channing in applause for health works theater at the apollo uh new york mac hansen award for new cabaret artist after dark award for outstanding cabaret artist of the year her character shante uh at the Tan Show Lounge won her titles of Miss Wisconsin, Miss New York, Miss Chicago, Miss Illinois, and she was the first Chicago performer in the history of the pageants to win the coveted Miss Florida contest. Woo, my lord, this woman. Oh, I don't even know how she can stand because all those awards must have had her head, made her head so big she'd fall over. But I don't think so with Alexandra. Now, in 2003, Alexandra filmed her first television movie for ABC TV, Romeo and Michelle, A New Beginning. Oh, I love those Romeo and Michelle movies. I don't know why they didn't just keep going. I love those. She then made television history by being the first trans Gendered, transgendered female to play a transgendered female character on television. Soon after, she was cast as the nasty transsexual with a heart of gold on the now defunct show Karen Sisko. I really like that show. Uh, in 2004, she filmed an episode of Grey's Anatomy, which went on to win a GLAAD award for Outstanding Episode. She's also appeared on ER and filmed the pilot Nurses for ABC, playing opposite one of her childhood idols, Lynn Redgrave. In 2007, she completed her first film, Socket, which is directed by her old Chicago pal, Sean Abley, and completed a pilot for FX directed by gorgeous Ryan Murphy and co-starring Joseph Fiennes and Blythe Danner. Oh, I love Blythe Danner. Called Pretty Handsome. Lastly, as an interesting side note, it is thought that almost every role played by her on stage has been the only time they've ever been recreated by a transgendered actress in the history of theater. So we are going to find out if that still holds true by talking to her today. Are you there, the Miss Wonderful? There goes lights underneath your feet. There's a red carpet heading your way. Is that all true, Miss Alexandra Billings? Woo! Oh boy, I hope so. I'm in the wrong shorts. <laughs> How are you today? I'm fine, my darling. How are you? Boy, that intro, my God. I was, I'm turning around to go, is Liza in the room? What's happening? Well, I tell you, I could have actually gone on. I think I, I could have gone on maybe six to ten to twenty more paragraphs because when I saw your bio, I'm like, oh, my God. I am never going to be able to whittle this shit down, this woman. Wow. What the hell am I going to do? I had to work long and hard, Alexandra, to get this down to my four little paragraphs because you are so incredible you have such a long history of work that it's really hard to encompass everything you've done and i hope that i didn't miss anything or leave any important parts out oh no none of the important parts dear no 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 <laughs> never never so let's start with um i know that you are in baltimore today if i'm correct and you're doing something exciting there or maybe something naughty i don't know if you want to share that with us but uh you are in baltimore we're doing a remote show today and um 
I want to thank you so much for taking time to be on the show. Let's start out with you. You were born in Inglewood, California, and this is a question that I ask most of my guests. I know that you say that you've been involved in theater since the age of five, but was it something that you wanted to be involved in? Because I know your father was a music teacher at Harbor College in Los Angeles. So was that something that you just loved to do? Or did you have dreams and aspirations of doing something else? Or has it always been theater? Well, you know, because of because I was sort of brought up in this theater, it really was something that I was surrounded by my whole life. But, you know, my mother always says that every time she opened the refrigerator door, I just did five minutes. Any kind of light that <laughs> shone on me, you know, it was, I've always been a ham. So, you know, but as, you, as I sort of grew older, I realized, oh, it's not just about, like, sort of being funny and silly. You actually have to work at this. And that was yeah. the big surprise for me, was that, you know, as I got older, I found out, oh, to make this a career, that's a lot of work. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a big bridge you have to cross right. when it becomes, you know, your livelihood. When you, have to, when you realize that every six months or a year, you know, you basically get fired. So you have to, <laughs> you know, find a new job. You're always job hunting, really. Right. Now, so you're talking about being in the theater, right? Yes, that's right. And it's, it's always something that, that I knew I would do, but once I started to actually do it, it, it becomes much more of a chore to maintain. And you really have to find your joy. And, you know, you really have to find, find out the reason that you're doing this. If it's because of the money, don't do it. It's because, if it's because of the joy, then you're, you're on the right track. I like that point. So when you were when you were younger, you thought it was all fun. There were costumes and music. And as a child, that's just like playing dress up, right? So you know, it's exactly it's right. Of- and you know, you're surrounded by grown ups, and you feel very grown up. And you know, you you sort of get to be treated like all the grown ups. And you know, at that time they were eighteen, but you know, to me they were grown ups. So you know, it's 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 very um, it's an illusion that you sort of live for a long time. And it's exactly what you said. It's like it's like playing dress up for a very, very long time. Right. So people who are getting started in theater, they actually think you got to do your research. I am sure you would agree with me, Alexandra, because a lot of people who are who are young who think that they want to make their life in theater um what advice would you give them because as you said if you're doing it for the money forget about it if you're doing it for the joy then by all means pursue it so what advice would you give them if they really really love the theater and they want to pursue it but they want to be able to eat a can of tuna fish as a luxury every once in a while what would you suggest that they do you know to be able to make income well, you're, I don't know that you're going to like my answer. Not a lot of people I, do. I want honesty. I, no, well, I love it. I love the dirty, down and dirty, gritty truth. So give it to me, Alexander, girl. I, re- I really think that in order, you cannot do anything else. This is going to make every parent in the world tear their hair out and jump <laughs> out windows. But you cannot do anything else. You cannot have a side job. You cannot have a second career. You cannot, you cannot do anything else. You have to do one thing and one thing only. And this is why I say, if it brings you joy and this is, it consumes you, art should consume you. You know, Michelangelo has a great quote. It's one of my favorites. I saw the angel in the stone and I carved to set it free. This is not somebody who does something because there's not, nothing else to do. This is something, this is somebody who does something because they're compelled to. So my advice is, first of all, don't have a side job. Go from theater to theater. Go from agent to agent. Knock on doors. Build your resume. Do anything. You, go to the opening of a letter. Do anything you freaking can to do this. And the second thing that I would say is start studying. Take class. Take every class. You can ask your friends. Ask your, if you're in college, ask your teachers now. If you're 45 years old, you know, I belong to the Steppenwolf Theater Company in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And for for those people who don't know, the Steppenwolf is a very uh, um, well-known theatrical company that was started by actors. It's a Tony Award-winning, Pulitzer Prize-winning theater company. 
And we have a, a company member uh, named John Mahoney who was on a TV show called Frasier for many, many years. And, you know, he didn't start acting until he was in his late 40s. And this is a guy who now has three Emmy Awards, who has a Tony Award, who's, uh, who has a, 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 a massive career. So I also say don't be discouraged. So focus, go to class, and don't let anyone tell you anything. Do what you need to do, and everyone else be damned. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Now, that is such an encouraging story to hear. And he's one of he's oh, my God, he was like one of my favorite characters on Frasier. And he's very talented, man. That is so inspirational because I get a lot of people who email me and say, well, I always wanted to pursue a career in theater and film, but I'm 38 or I'm 45 or I'm 50. Do you really think that I have a shot? What is your advice to the people who are older? I mean, if there, I would say personally, I'd say if you're doing it again for joy and happiness, you can do it for a hobby. But what if they say, I'm tired of the career I'm in? Do I have a shot of doing it full time? What, what do you say about that? What would they have to do to make a transition from them working a non-acting job and then to suddenly be able to do it? What, what's your advice or what would you say about that? Well, I have to tell you, in a world where Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan are famous, <laughs> anything is possible. So that's the first thing we have to remember. And the second thing is, the second thing is, our business has very little to do with talent. I don't believe in that word. I don't believe it exists. I believe in gifts. I believe people have gifts. And I believe every single person has their own unique gift that they were born with. What you need to do is experience your gift, believe in your gift, and live your gift. Once you do that, then you can figure out how to craft it. I don't care if you're 68 years old. What's happening to you, I believe, if you're saying to yourself, you know what, I'm sick and tired of being working at Starbucks. I'm sick and tired of being a housewife. I'm sick and tired of whatever it is that's happening to you. This is a voice that's coming from somewhere else that's telling you, what you're doing right now has served its purpose. Now it's time for you to go do something else. That's part of your gift and part of your power. Once you realize that and once you own that, anything is possible. There's no such thing as too late, not when you're talking about your own gift. That's like saying, I'm giving you this, this Christmas gift or Hanukkah gift. Oh, but it's too late. It's two days after. It's never too late to give away your gift, ever. So don't ever, ever let that. Those are other people's voices coming at you, telling you it's too late. It's never too late. So it, at any point in your life when you've decided, when something else has come in and said to you, this has served its purpose, now you need to go on this path. Go on that path. What, let me ask, what, in your opinion, what characteristic traits does it take to survive in the world of theater and film? <laughs> a good sense of humor. First of all, you gotta have a you, you gotta you gotta be able to laugh at yourself. You gotta be able to laugh at the business because believe me when I tell you, the insane the insane asylum has opened up and swallowed Hollywood. Everyone <laughs> everyone in that town is cuckoo. They're nuts. They're crazy. They're off their rocker. So you have to you have to kind of go in. You have to kind of go in with a sense of humor, so you can't take anything too seriously. That's, that's really the main thing. It, like I said, go in with a sense of joy. You know, I know a lot of people in this business that are really successful, that are on hit TV shows or have a lot of money and are, are movie stars. I know a lot of those people that are incredibly unhappy. And you look at their life and you look at their house, you look at their pools and you look at their, and you're thinking, really, you're unhappy? Are you not? I'll show you unhappy. But, <laughs> but it's really about, it's really about going in and saying to yourself, you know what? I'm going to do this thing because I need to express myself in this way. And, and, and that goes for any kind of art, whether you're a painter or a designer or whatever it is that you're doing. I need to express myself this way. And you cannot take yourself you cannot allow yourself to believe, well, this is going to change the world. I mean, it might, but don't go in with that attitude or you're going to drive yourself nuts. You have to know that the people that are hiring you are just as nervous, just as scared, and just as bananas as you are. All of us went in for, to it for the same reason. 
Right, right. So that's right. the biggest thing. Don't lose your sense of humor. Don't lose your sense of humor. So you would say uh, definitely sense of humor. And what if people, some people I know, I don't know if you've come across people like this, but uh, I was involved in theater for a while. And I know people who are doing theater who take it so seriously. Uh, I don't want to, it's usually the people who study the, I hate to say this, but study the classical Shakespeare type plays. And boy, they just get so wound up if you, if somebody does something that uh, is not theater-esque, like God forbid you mention anything from Macbeth, they would have a fit and storm off the stage and just <laughs> refuse to come back. And they wanted some sage, I guess, to... <laughs> to cleanse the theater. Now, I have seen a lot of drama queens in the theater. Now, is this taking it serious or is this taking it way too serious? I mean, would you say that those people have uh, a sense of humor and 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 some of them have become very successful? What is your what is your comment about that? You know, I did <laughs> I did a a a, a reading with uh, Lilius White, uh, who's a uh, who's a Broadway uh, performer, who was in The Life. She won the Tony for uh, the Broadway show The Life, and she and I did this show in Chicago at the Theater Building. Oh, I can't believe I'm remembering this. My mind is like mush. I can't believe I'm remembering this. <laughs> and she is a fantastic woman, and she has an amazing, an amazing voice. And she's she's. Uh, uh, unbelievably gifted in a myriad of ways. And she and I had this great uh, conversation a couple of days before we were going to open. And she was talking about, we were both talking about this very thing, and she was talking about this actress who shall remain nameless, who was working with, who's a very, very big Tony Award winning actress on Broadway, who was very particular about the temperature in the theater. It had to be a certain temperature or she wouldn't go on. And I, can't, I think it was like 71 degrees or some ridiculous thing. So she was very particular about this. And Lilius, you know, said, well, you know, I don't. She was backstage complaining, this actress. And Lilius said, well, listen, dear, you know, here's the thing. We can't really get the, 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 the theater to a certain uh, temperature all the time. It's just not going to happen. So you're going to have to figure this out. She said, well, I'm not used to working in theaters that are 70, mark, 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 and all this other stuff. And Lilith says, going, well, okay, well, let's just calm down and see if we can just get through this, you know, play together. It was musical, actually. This musical together, and let's just try and, you know, work together and so on and so forth. So this woman got so crackers about it that she started to complain to the stage manager, to the stage hands, to anyone who would listen. A week later, she was fired. Wow. They fired her. Because she was too much trouble. Yeah. So here's the thing. If you're going to go in with a big bag of hoo-ha and you're going to complain constantly, it doesn't matter how famous you are or how not famous you are, somebody's always above you and somebody's going to go, you know what, you're too much trouble, honey, and you're replaceable. So get out. Yeah. And, you know, I find that that's more pre- ever. Well, actually, it's it's it, it's I find that they do it now more than they did it before. I don't know if it's because there are a lot more younger people that are in control in the suits, shall we say, that don't have mm-hmm. patience for it. But I I. I think that back in the day, you know, prior to maybe the 90s, they were much more patient with those type of actors, those divas and prima donnas uh, in, in theater. But I think that today that, you know, they're not putting up with it as much. And, and you know more about this than, than I do. Do you do you feel that that's true, that they're not being as patient because there's 20 actors to one actor they could replace you with? Is that true? I think that probably is true. I mean, I don't know how far we want to go back, but I mean, you know, do we still want to be able to vote? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how far we. You know what I mean? I don't really know how far we want to go back, but I think I always hear stories about, you know, in the 1930s and 1940s. You know, they used to pick people from Broadway, handpick them to come and make movies. But you know, sound had just been invented, and so all the movie stars that were making silent movies, a lot of their voices were, you know. Bad. You know, right. a lot of the sort of big rough men kind of, so I think it was, I think the, 
the deal that Hollywood and Broadway struck with each other was very different, and I think they handled them differently. I think, you know, plus they were under studio contracts, and they were guaranteed work, and now everyone's a free agent. So, uh, you know, I think you might be right in the size and the number. There's a heck of a lot more competition out there. But I, I, I think that there's... I think it depends on where you go, that there's, uh, I think most of us, maybe it's just my optimism coming through, but I think most of us have a respect for other artists as well. You know, I, when I go get cast in a show, I assume that everybody in the show has their, you know, stuff together and that they're not you know, just roaming clowns, that they're actual artists and actors and they're going to, you know, know their lines. I mean, I can get pretty nasty if someone is on stage and they're, they're screwing around. That makes me mad. I mean, I've said things but to, to various actors, but, I, you know, I guess it depends on where you go. Yeah. I don't know that, that the attitudes between actors have changed so much, but I think you may have a point in the mm. producer-actor uh, yeah. relationship. That might be different. Oh, yeah, I, I see that a lot more often. They're not as patient as they used to be, for sure. Now, let's talk about um, the how, to, because you've done theater and film, how, how difficult is it as a theatrical actress to make the transition into film, one? And two, second part of the question is, uh, what percentage of actors actually really, really want to make the transition to film, uh, and why would they do that? Because if their first love is theater, because film and theater is so different with film, as you know, it's hurry up and wait. With theater, you get instant gratification. Um, Let's talk about that. What what's the transition? Uh, how how hard is it? Because I hear that it's a it's a major transition for some. With others, they can do it. So, what do you think about that? Well, for me personally, it was a very difficult transition because I I you know I'm so large anyway, and so to 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 go on to a film set and have to be contained and that's really what it is it's not about being like smaller you know people people always talk, use that word and talk about well you have to be smaller on film and that's not necessarily true I mean look at Glenn Close that mm-hmm. woman's huge all over the place <laughs> but so I think there's a there's an acting muscle that you have to practice so I think that's that's paramount I think and also just the business in and of itself is so odd because in television and film land, you're a commodity. You know, being transgender, I'm, I'm, I'm a commodity. I'm a commodity to be, to be sold. But that's mm-hmm. kind of true of everybody. If you mm-hmm. look at the people on television now, you know, everybody's fantastic looking. I mean, right. you know, you look at Grey's Anatomy. I've never had a doctor looking like that of you. <laughs> Holy <No. God. laughs> My God in heaven, I, I'd have something wrong with me every week. They look like that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, there's something, there's something to be said in you selling yourself. So, right. you know, it really depends on how you feel about that. Right. But the, the logistical uh, uh, part of it is, is difficult, meaning, you know, being on stage and having to uh, express yourself in a very, very large open way as opposed to being on a film set, you know, with 55 crew members and microphones and cameras and, you know, you're trying to film an intimate setting and there's 25 people chewing popcorn around you. It's, it's very, it's very bizarre. And then you it's have to bizarre. hurt and then you have to wait. You wait for hours yeah, and hours Yeah, there's a lot of waiting. Waiting. It's there's, hurt. You yeah, have to wait. You do a five second scene and then it's like, okay, cut. We need to reset. Uh, you know, and you're good. And that's, that's exactly that's, right. That's uh, exactly right. I tell you, though, the great you. thing about film is that once you finally get on set, which can take 100 years, but once you finally get on set and you're you're doing the scene, the great thing about film, this is a great gift for me that I've discovered. You can do things like 10 or 15 times, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to theater where you do it that one night and that's it. Yeah. It's done. It's out in the atmosphere. Right. But in film, you can do it again and again and again and again and again. Now, granted, you have no control. It's up to the editor and the director, right. uh, you know, depending on what people will actually see. But what's great about it is you get a chance to repeat, like, all mm-hmm. day long. So that's kind of great, too. But like I said, it's a different 
muscle. You know, it's a different right. part of your soul. Exactly. But it's a difficult business to get into. You know, everybody wants to be, everyone who starts out in this business, me included, wants to be famous and wants to be rich. Everybody wants to do that. And then once you, and it, truly, it's very rare. And not that it doesn't happen, but it's very rare that it doesn't happen unless you become either a television or a film star. And that's kind of true. Yeah, for sure. Now, let's talk about the uh, wonderful world that you occupy, and that is being a transgendered actress. Now, uh, let's talk about how many, in your estimation, transgendered people are in the combination acting film world, and to what level of success have they have they taken their parts or their roles or their characters or whatever you feel uh, success is different for different people. But what do you think, what world uh, in the transgender community can they expect to reach? Because writers, you know, just like for large people, uh, just like for minorities, it's very difficult to get writers to write. Again, as you said, Grey's Anatomy, look at the people that are being, it's the parts that are being written for. Let's, what about the writers? Is there any, any kind of pressure being put on the writers or any type of committee or anything saying, hey, we are a society, we are a community, we need you to write parts for us? Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Boy, yeah. I, should, I, I need to tape you and just put you on a megaphone and take you to my auditions. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> we need a um, coalition! <laughs> that's a really good idea. Let's start one, for heaven's sake. There you go. Um, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's such a complicated, I'll try and simplify this in my brain as much as I can. Uh, you know, being transgender is complicated enough in mainstream society. Then you add to it, okay, do we want the transgender characters or do we want just characters played by transgender people. You know, what is it we want? And my manager, Billy Miller, who is just a dream, um, he and I, you know, but most of my theatrical career has been just playing people. I, I, I never, and that wasn't by choice. That was truly by accident. I just got, I played two transgender characters in my entire theatrical career, and that's been over 30 years now. And I only started playing transgender people when I got to Hollywood. So it's been very odd. There's not, you know, nobody really knows how to write for us yet. And that's nobody's fault except probably maybe our own, meaning the transgender community. You know, we're so steeped in our own sort of shame and guilt about what we are still. We're such a young community that Mm -hmm. very few of us are out. You know, very few of us talk about it. We want to make up a past or we want to lie or we want to, you know, live falsely, which I think is ridiculous. Okay. So the writers have no basis. Uh, they, ha- they have nothing to write for because they don't know us. Right. So it's really not their fault. But there's very few roles that are specifically transgender sort of out there anyway. Okay. And then when you start to put me in a category of, well, I just want to act. I just want to play Roles doesn't matter what they are. I just want to work. I just want to pay my bills. I want to buy bologna for heaven's sake. <laughs> so you know when you when you kind of put that in the equation, then Hollywood gets a little nervous because then they're like, well, wait a minute. What if people find out and what if they know it? What's going to happen? And the earth will swallow us up and God will come down and tell us that we're you know all these terrible things are going to happen. Right. So it's 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 a literal dichotomy. Mm-hmm. I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. Right. The, the, I can tell you this, though. I can tell you a statistic. Would you like a statistic to make me sound I really love, smart? I love it. Love it. Okay, good. There are eight registered transgender actresses in SAG, which is the union, wow. national union for you. Yeah, eight. Oh. Wow. There's eight of us. So that gives you some idea of you know, how big our community is in the arts. Now, how many of them 
ensuring that we know are transgender and are not out, I don't know that ratio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But literally, when I go on an audition, the same five women always shows up. It's always oh. Capernaum <laughs> Adams. I know. It's the same five. Capernaum Adams, Candace Kane, uh, Kelly Mantle, uh, Willem Belly. There's always like five of us that show up at the exact same audition all the God, time. It's, it's so time. wild. It's so true because I'm a large woman and uh, I'm a plus size uh, actress and model. And every audition I go on, it's the same people. It's mm -hmm. like, of course it is. and and and, and of I it is. kind of, I'm kind of like in the same category that you are because um, it's like the same people of the same size going out for the same roles and we constantly are being called for the same parts it's like that they only they only call us because i guess maybe there aren't that many large people that are going out there trying for the roles because they think oh well they're all skinny hot people i'm not going out there so they don't even try so maybe there's more transgender people who want to be involved in uh theater and film but maybe they just haven't gotten to that up that point yet so i was going to ask is there any do you foresee anybody uh stepping out because obviously transgender people uh there's got to be some writers amongst you guys that are going to say you know what nobody's writing parts for us i'm going to go out there and i'm going to write parts is there no one in the lgbt community that you know is taking the the reins and saying let's start writing parts because we are part of society and we need to be heard. Is there anybody doing that that you know of? Well, Calpurnia Adams, who's a dear friend and a wonderful actress, is actually doing that. She has her own production company. Okay. Uh, Candace Kane was on Dirty Sexy Money for about a year, okay. and uh, she's got a great career ahead of her. Uh, she doesn't write a lot of her stuff, but uh, she's, she's helping pave the way as well. Um, I'm in the midst with Marlo Benier, a, a very dear friend of mine, of writing a movie as well. And, you know, it's the same in, in, in theater uh, as it is in Hollywood, especially for the transgender community or any minority. And it's exactly what you said. Write your own stuff. And that's, yeah. the, yep, that's what we're all doing. And I think that's what's going to, you know, and you know this, my love, from being yeah. in Hollywood, is that Hollywood is made for 12-year-old, anorexic, skinny white people. Yep. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's it's a right true. That. And it's so true. if you're not one of those people, then, you know, you're sitting in the back of the bus. And yeah. so if you've got, if you know that, if you know that, and not that, not that I'm making any disparaging remarks against my community, but if you know that, then your job is to not be silenced. That is your job. That's not only your job as an artist, because you need to find your voice. That's your job as a human being. So don't walk around the planet with a piece of duct tape on your lips. Right. Speak your truth. That's what's going to change. That's what's yes. going to break down the wall. That's what's going to knock on the doors is you and your own voice. Right. And you've got to stress to whomever the powers that be to get people to write more parts. I mean, me as a large woman, I am actually considered, they have in SAG, they have a... Um, they have uh, affirmative action, but they also have, uh, um, it's called, uh, oh God, I can't remember the exact name, but it's for handicapped and um, disabled and minorities. I guess there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a coalition that they actually try to urge the writers to write more parts for these people. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a white woman, large white woman. They categorize me in the minority. I'm a minority in Hollywood because again, as you said, they're all skinny, white, beautiful people. And anyone that doesn't fit in that category, I mean, I'm in the category with African Americans and blacks and disabled people because I'm a large white woman. And, um, 
and they are, but SAG somehow got people uh, together to form this group or committee that is urging the writers to write more for these people. And there's actually a group behind it. So I think we need to get a group of people to speak more for the transgendered uh, community to get more parts uh, in mainstream movies. I really think that that, that needs to happen. I, I, I really I would like to see you. it. I like to say, so we need to get our damn picket signs, girl. <laughs> there you go. Let's put Woo! on our dresses and go picket. Oh, we need to capture some writers, and we need to do what um, my boy, boy George did, and tie him up and handcuff him to a chair, and then just do do scenes for him for a whole weekend and show him how talented we are. Handcuff the little writer. Let's, let's tie him up and let's tie him up to a chair and smoke cigarettes. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> That'll Love do it, it. for him. <laughs> hey, we got one minute, uh, a couple minutes left. Actually, one minute left. I want to know what's going on. What do you have coming up? Well, I'm going to be at uh, Feinstein's at the Regency in New York City on um, August 20th and 21st. So I got a big gig coming up. Okay. Um, and the show the show is at 8. Oh, God, what time is the show? I don't remember what time the show is. But it's the 20th and 21st of August. Okay. And uh, then I start rehearsal for the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas in September. And then I'm going to be doing a production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in L.A. Oh. with Jeff Perry in January, directed by my wife, Kristen Blankenship. Oh, and where where is this going to be? Where are the venues for the last three that you said? Uh, Whorehouse, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I should know this, but this is why my assistant is my assistant, <laughs> and because I have no brain, and okay. I'm old, and property. <laughs> and the other one is going to be, wait a minute, I do know this place. It's called, Virginia Woolf is going to be at, wait, The Lost. Ha-ha! I remember. Yes. I Woo. want a prize. Somebody give me a prize now, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, they can find out everything they need to know on your website, and that is yes. uh, Alexandra, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A-B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S dot com, and I'm sure you have everything listed there. Your assistant keeps it updated. Am I right? You are correct, or they will be fired. Oh, they better not be. You're too nice of a person. Fantastic. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much, my darling. God bless you. Good luck. And let's get more people to write for transgendered actors as well as big, hot, sexy white women. So, woo, power to us. Exactly. <laughs> thank you, darling. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next week on Question Reality, alexandrabillings.com. See ya. Thanks, love. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio.